what's going on? What's going on? Welcome to 2.6 linear regression models. And we actually started talking about linear regression models. You just muted yourself, <laughs> which uh, you're, uh, you turned yourself there. That was fun. My bad. <laughs> okay. we actually, yeah, we actually mentioned linear regression models uh, last time we were talking. And so we're going to continue that conversation. You muted yourself again. <laughs> All right, I guess I'm teaching this and now I can only see part of the title slide. Oh my gosh, Miss Young is losing her mind today. You back? I'm, I'm here. <laughs> I don't know what you're doing. You're doing I don't either. It's, it's, listen, it's Saturday. My brain is not on work mode. That's the problem. Yeah. And it's really hot out and you ran, run in this morning. So your brain's probably fried. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to take that linear regression model, which is that line that we saw in the last video. And we're going to use it in its predicted response model. And so you probably hopefully did this in algebra two. And so this shouldn't be like brand new stuff for you. We're gonna change a couple of things up though. Yeah, we're so, gonna use a little more fancy language and probably be some notational things that you're not used to. Right. And the big thing is then that second one is the notation is very different in statistics. Yeah. So we're not gonna say your 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 high school like Algebra one, algebra two teacher probably called this a like line of best fit. And we're not going to call it a line of best fit. We're going to call it a linear regression model. And we're going to use this Y with this little like triangle over it. A lot of times you'll see this called like Y hat. That is just, it stands for, well, yeah, that why are you wearing that hat? That's because, because a Mr. Bobby hat. Uh-huh. As okay. opposed to now Mr. Bobby, now right. Mr. Bobby hat. When it's got a little thing on top, and that statisticians, again, they always hedge their bets and use wishy-washy words. This is like a wishy-washy equation. Yep, exactly right, a wishy-washy equation. So it's saying that we're telling you that we're gonna find a value, but you need to understand that our answer isn't exact. That's what it's saying, that your this Y that we calculate is not an exact Y value, that it is estimated from data. And you're gonna kind of see why we say, it's not exactly this, but it's probably something like this, okay? So we can put that hat on a lot of things, and a lot of times we'll use like words and we'll put that hat on words, you're gonna see that. And that just means we're finding a predicted response that is not an exact answer. But our equation still has a slope and it still has a y-intercept, but we are going to get rid of them. I'm just, I'm going to be honest with you. This is going to be confusing for about a second. There's still b, like in y equals mx plus b, but now b is slope. So if you're thinking about your former algebra class, you learned y equals mx plus b, which actually the math person in me doesn't like this model. I really actually do love the stats approach because if you, if you had to graph a line, well, think about all the times you graph. What do you do first when you graph a line? Start with the y-intercept, which is the initial value. Mm -hmm. And then you add a change in x, a whole bunch of them, right? If the slope was two thirds, you'd rise two, run three, rise two, run three, rise two, run three. Well, we're gonna do the same thing. We have the same sort of model, but the way statisticians look at it is they say predicted Y is found with the model A, which is the Y intercept, plus BX, where B is the slope or the rate of change of the two variables that we're talking about. It really does actually make more sense if you stop and think about it to put it the, the y-intercept first because that's what you deal with graphically and that's also when you're going to start when you start counting from um, zero you start with that number and you're going to be adding b over and over and over again so the equation actually does make or a lot you could have like a petri dish of cells 
and mm -hmm. you're wanting to look at how fast they're dying or something like that. Well, that's still your initial amount of cells and then the rate of death of the cells from there. So like a, regardless that Y value or that Y intercept value is kind of, we think about it as the initial value. Um, mm -hmm. And then the slope is your growth, whether you're increasing or decreasing. And I know I was guilty of this as an algebra teacher, not Miss Young, but this one. We, in algebra class, you've also done some stuff, possibly done some stuff where you use that equation, y equals mx plus b, to make predictions. Statisticians don't do that so much. We're going to talk more about that when we get to it, okay? So we, we do use it to predict, but we only use it to predict within the data set that we're looking at or very, very close to it. You don't like to go too far away. Right, extrapolation is when you use that equation to predict something that is, and you can see here where it says, beyond the interval of X values used to determine that regression line. And then the further out you get, the less and less reliable your information is going to be. And we're gonna look at an example of this, but that is called extrapolation. <laughs> Stats is wishy-washy. Yes, we're wishy-washy because we don't wanna, we don't wanna make a commitment beyond what we already know. And that's, I mean, and that's actually been our experience for the last three or four months. So we we'll look at right. right, making all kinds of decisions off of things we don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're bringing this back because we haven't looked at this graph enough yet, but I'm adding some more information to it now. So it says median income in Arkansas since 2000. Remember we talked about um, the fact that this is like, a, that R value is 0.38. So it's not a super strong correlation, but no matter what the correlation looks like, we actually can get a model. Whether that model's great or not, well, that's something that you have to decide as the statistician. So let's look at, pull up my annotation here. Let's look at, we want to determine the slope. So we're going to just start by looking at a computer generated output for Y hat or the prediction model. Okay. So yeah, it's negative 2870.47.72709 plus 165.7 blah, 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 right? So we have to decide what part of that model is the slope part. And if you think back, y equals mx plus b is your experience. We're going to go away from that, but you're still caught up on that. Where is the slope in that one? That's the thing that's attached to the x. So I want the number that's attached to the x as my slope. So that would be 165 point whatever the decimal points are. Yeah. Now, guys, we're not going to um, formalize this yet, but you shouldn't write numbers and stats without understanding what the number means. You just shouldn't do it. It's bad practice. Okay. So let's think back to what is slope and how do you determine slope? Well, if I remember my slope from algebra one, it was rise over run. Now I know it's that's like third grade slope. Okay, maybe not third grade. Right. So if you looked at this eight line, I would rise from one point and then run. And I didn't run to the next point, obviously, in the graph, but on the line. You may have also seen it as delta y over delta x, maybe not as. You have seen it as delta y over delta x. What? We hope you have. Yeah. yeah. Okay, or y1 minus y2, x2 minus y, that's, that's what it means. Yeah. It's a change in y or a change in x. So what it means is it's the y values, which in this case are median income, mm -hmm. divided by the year. So it's the change in income over time in years right okay so that should be that should have units i think is where you're going right yep yep income per year okay 
So we really need, and that's not something you necessarily did in an algebra class, but we're not, we're not going to be doing Y2 minus Y1, blah, blah, blah. We're right. going to pick it out of, a, out of a result or a, either from the calculator or from a computer and try to interpret what it means in the context. We're using that to be able to predict the increase of one thing or decrease, if it were negative, the right. change in the Y over the change in the X. Right. So in this case, we'd be looking at like dollars per year, income per year. Okay. And we would have an overall increase um, in income per year. And we talked about the fact that this isn't a great model. It's, it's the R value is, you know, below 0.5 and, and that's maybe not great. <clears throat> okay. Let's look at Y intercept. So that's the number that's not attached to um, the X. And remember, they're going to be ref they're going to be reflected. Now, if you write it in Y equals M X plus B form for us, I don't think we're going to have a conniption. But you're going to see it in all the problems, and every time it's given to you, it's going to be A plus B X. Okay, yeah. just move around your head. It's cool. Uh, the Y intercept would be negative twenty eight seven blah 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 blah. Okay, this number right here is the Y intercept. I'm not even going to try to write that down. Um, so we're looking at this Y intercept that's negative 287,000 and some change. And let's get a unit on that. So look at the fact that it's a Y intercept. And so go over to the Y axis and grab a unit. What do you think, Mr. Bobby? Well, that's supposed to be income, but I don't want to owe $300,000 or almost $300,000. That's like, that don't make sense to me. Right. So why, why do you think in this context, the number doesn't make any sense? Hmm. Well, because we're doing years and we're like, you know, pretty far into this calendar thing that we like to call the Gregorian calendar. You know. <laughs> um, that would be what the equation would have predicted. My income would have been in year zero. Yep. <laughs> Year zero, because think about it, guys. The y-intercept and this, market, by the way, this graph is not great because it starts at two thousand. So it looks like the y-intercept is going to be just over forty-four thousand. So this is another thing you have to be really, really careful of with scatter plots and regression lines: is the zero, the y-intercept, where it where X is zero could potentially be really far away from what you're seeing. Yeah. So this would be dollars. And if I ask you to explain this in context, you would tell me that this doesn't make sense. Yeah, you could, I mean, I explained it to her and then I would follow that by saying, you are really silly, Miss Young. I'm not, that don't make no sense. But that doesn't really happen because Arkansas didn't even exist in year zero. And not neither did American dollars. On the planet, but it wasn't but called Arkansas. As a country and, you know, the income of American dollars made, meant nothing in year zero. Right. Okay? And this is a little bit of the idea of extrapolation, of going too far. The data that if, may fit the data we have from 2000 to 2018, but I can't go down to year zero. And I can't extend this out too far either direction. So I'm not gonna tell you what you're gonna make in year 3000, okay? I'm not gonna let the model tell me that. So. Right. So let's think about predicting for the year 2020. So how could we use an equation to predict for 2020? Well, that's year, that's the X, right? So I gotta put this um, number in. So I'm gonna have negative 287. She's going to get it a lot faster than me, probably. Well, it's 165. By the way, $165 a year, that's like how much more you make per year. That's pretty crummy raise. <laughs> so while he's taking the time to actually plug 2020 in, I like to just visualize it and verify that whatever I get is going to make sense, right? So he's going to type this in the calculator and, <laughs> and get an answer for you. 
and I'm gonna make him bigger so you can see his result. And while he's doing that, I extended the x-axis to 2020 and then went up to the graph and then over to the y-axis to say, okay, I'm expecting his answer to be somewhere between 49,000 and 50,000. And it is 47,784.8. So 47? Did I do something wrong? No, I could just have the line bad because I drew it. Did I? So, and that's another issue is if you drew this line it's like I did. Yeah. Yeah. It's around 48. Yeah. If I, if you drew this line the way I did, you could have potentially the same issue because it looks like I have the slope tilted a little too high. Yeah, I and you might not have that line. I assume you just threw that line on top of yeah, a bunch of Yes. I, um, I'll say this, like, I still wouldn't trust this because look at the data um, later on in the graph. We had another spike in income. So yeah. I would actually expect to see 2020 up there with that data. And so this in itself, just two years could be potential extrapolation mm -hmm. because you're using a lot of this past data to drive what you think is happening where if i were to have cut this information off at like say 2010 my slope would make a little would be a little steeper right well so, and we also know that this year there has been a record number of unemployment so who knows what the number that's, might true. that's true we could have seen a huge drop because you're right there's been a lot of unemployment so look at this slide this is a mess yeah, I know. This is terrible. I'm sorry. <laughs> but at least I feel like I'm teaching, like I'm doing my thing, even though I'm, my rotate, my handwriting is terrible. <laughs> so this actually, this lesson is actually pretty easy because it's this concept of, can we use a model to make predictions? Okay. So let's look at, I'm going to move us. We're in the way. Uh, it is common knowledge that cars and trucks lose value the more they are driven. Can we predict the price of a used Ford F-150 Super Crew 4x4 truck if we know how many miles it has on the odometer? A random hey, sample of... What? Our front yard. What are you doing taking pictures in my front yard? Um, <laughs> are you Tim Graham? Oh, I guess not. You did actually. I was going to say, you know, I do live in Malvern, so, you know, I, there are lots of trucks like that in around Malvern. <laughs> um, it says a random sample of 16 used Ford trucks um, were selected from autotrader.com. And um, here's the data. So I did steal this problem from a book, so I didn't actually grab this data off of autotrader. I worry about this problem. I actually met the author of our textbook. And the only reason this problem is in there is because um, the book is very popular in Texas and the publisher told him to write a problem about Ford trucks for Texas. Oh my gosh, I did not know that. <laughs> you picked the problem, he told me this story. They made him write, it, write this problem for Texas. Well, you know. Yeah. That was the okay. rednecks in Texas. <laughs> so here's the scatter plot. It says in the prompt that the plot shows a moderately strong, so you can kind of see skinny puppy dog here, and it's negative because it's decreasing, and it looks pretty linear, uh, association between miles driven and the decreasing price of that truck. Oh yeah, skinny puppy dog, I remember that now. Yes, skinny puppy dog. And uh, it says there are no outliers, so what the, author of this problem has done is they've given you duffs. They have described the problem for you so that you don't even have to think about that part. Um, it does say, however, there are two distinct clusters of trucks, a group of 12 trucks between zero and 80,000, and then another four trucks between 120,000 and 160,000. So you can sort of see those distinctions in the graph. Um, now I've pulled a Mr. Bobby. Oh yeah, at least <laughs> you do the wonky noise. True, true. Um, so I got rid of my annotating tool, so now it's not letting me annotate anything. So I don't even know how to fix that. So you're gonna have to write. There we go, she's back. 
Okay, so you can see that first cluster of data here and that second cluster of data here. Okay, so really quick so that we're having this discussion. What is the slope on this line, Mr. Bobby? It would be the, uh, the negative 1 point, I'm sorry, negative 0.1629, the number in front of the X. And what do we think the units on that slope are? That would be price per mile. So okay. every time I drive my truck, I lose 16 cents, <laughs> one mile. That's what, it, that's what it literally means. For every mile you drive. My truck goes down by about 16 cents. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so let's about, see, what does it take? It takes uh, how many miles to lose a dollar value off of your truck? <laughs> uh, that would be about six or seven miles, about six miles. Yeah, about, yes, yeah. Every time I drive to work, I lose like, you know, four, four bucks, something like yeah. that. This is not a number maybe I wanted to know. <laughs> yeah, so now you actually know what the slope means and why we care. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then what about the y-intercept in this problem? The y-intercept would be 38,257, the, yeah. the number in the front. And what that means is that's the, the value of the truck the moment it is manufactured and has zero on the odometer. That's right. That would be this point right here on the y-axis. So when the miles driven are zero, so when it is new, the price of the truck is um, about $38,000. Now there are a few po points there that are above that value. I can see those two up there. Those are probably like the super you know, loaded trucks. You know, they have some miles on them, but they're the ones with all the bells and whistles. And uh, yeah. Yeah. I wish that I had taken the time just out of curiosity to Google um, what the average um, Ford, what are we looking at? F-150 uh, yeah. cost, but I did not take the time to do that. Yeah. But if a Ford, well, you know, it's a Ford and we're already at a hundred thousand miles. We're probably going to, it's probably going to die anyway. <laughs> oh wait, yeah, there's now the Ford. So it says use the model to predict, and I'm going to actually make me go away and make Mr. Bobby bigger again, because he's about to use the model to predict using his calculator. We want to be able to see that. Um, the 100,000 miles, the 100,000 miles. Okay, we can actually, I'm going to give you the actual answer here. I'm just going to plug in the equation into my calculator. 21,967, 21,967. Okay. Now, all he did, what did I just say? 21,967? Okay. Now, there is a less accurate way of doing this. I could go over to 100,000 miles. So this would be to my graph. Yeah. And then I got to kind of go over. Sorry, I know I can't draw straight and I would I didn't do a great job of that. But according to that model, I would then estimate. Now you see the problem here. There's a whole lot of estimating and even if I had a ruler or had the ability in my life to draw a straight line, I could have used the line tool. I still have to ballpark. Yeah. Okay, but yeah. I can get an estimate. Is twenty about twenty two thousand a ridiculous estimate of what I've just done? No, I think it's about it's in the right in the ballpark. I'm not gonna like have a meltdown over it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then it says how many miles would have to be? Um, how many miles would there be on the truck if it was going to be worth about eighteen thousand dollars according to this model? So yeah. now you actually have to do a little algebra. Because now you're saying Y, predicted Y is 18,000. And you have to set that equal to your 38257. He's going to get there pretty fast. Yeah. So, um, and so what did you do first, Mr. Bobby? First thing I did was I subtracted the 38,257. So I took it took 18,000 and minus the 38,000 because I'm going to bring it over just like I'm solving an equation. And that gave me about 20, negative 20,000 ish. Okay. Or negative 20,257. And then I'm going to divide by the slope with a negative 0.1629. And I've got it up here. I did. Oh, how about I hit enter and get the answer? That'll be great. So we're getting 124,352. 
124,352, good. And so that's how many miles would be on a Ford or you should expect to be on a Ford if somebody were selling it to you. Like they're saying, here's my truck. I'm selling it for $18,000. If it's got more miles on it or less miles, like you begin to wonder, you know, what's going on here. Yeah. And there's, I mean, this is essential. This is at least part of the equations used by those uh, value estimator websites like Kelly Blue Book, you may have heard of them, the companies that price used vehicles, that's how they come up with these estimates. Okay. Um, and then now yeah. so there's the other answer. Now the last problem, I'm going to we're going to drive it for a quarter of a million miles. And I, if it didn't last a hundred thousand it if a Ford can't last that long, it's not going to last a quarter of a million. I my Toyota Tundra. It's cool. It's going to last You're forever. Absurd. Okay. So he all he did here because we're talking miles and miles are X's, right? So he just took two hundred and fifty thousand, plugged it in for X in his calculator, and he gets how much? I'm going to have to owe somebody something. Negative two thousand four hundred and sixty-eight dollars. You drove it for so long that you got to the road. You gotta give Ford money. <laughs> you give Ford money to get it back on the road because it's dead. Guys, <laughs> you know. right. this right here, it says, do you believe this is a reliable estimate? Like, that's crazy. Of course you don't believe that. That's a reliable estimate. This is extrapolation. You cannot go all, think about how far out that is um, from where this, data is stopping, right? It's way too far out. This is definitely extrapolation. Okay, how are we doing? We're doing pretty good? Great, let's go and stir some more pots. All right. <laughs> so I went to the census, my favorite place to grab some data because it's pretty reliable. And I collected this information from Central Arkansas cities. I looked up what is their total population? What is their percent of college graduation? What is their median income? What is the percent white population? What is the percent African American population? And what is the percent Hispanic population? Oh my goodness. At the very bottom, I just put Arkansas. So if you're wondering how these cities fare with Arkansas, that actually explains a lot of what I see in my neighborhoods. Stop. <laughs> Sorry, anybody who lives out here. <laughs> um, one thing I found interesting about um, Hot Springs is, look, mm, mm, what's Sorry. wrong with me today? Uh, look at this uh, Hispanic population in Hot Springs. I did not. Well, I, 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 I can see that. Interesting that Hot Springs has the second lowest college grad of all the cities you collected. I would have assumed Hot Springs had a higher percentage of college grads than that. Agreed. Um, so, and then I didn't put a comma in this, but I don't know why. Um, you can see that the average or the median income in Arkansas for um, cities is about um, almost 46,000. And you can kind of see where people fare from there. Um, anything on here ranging from, you know, like 32,000 ish to, um, Bryant at 65,000. What? How did that happen? <laughs> a, they play foot, they pay the football players really well on Bryant. They pay. <laughs> okay. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at some models that try to predict, uh, our income. Okay, we're going to look at some models that try to predict our income. So here's the first one. It's the one everybody assumes to be true. We think that, and, and I should preface this by, by backing up and saying, look how few cities I grabbed. If I really wanted to do this honestly, I would, and I wanted to do like just central Arkansas, I would want to get all the cities within the region, if possible, to have more data to talk about. 
And you'd also, if you notice, she, I mean, if you, what are the ones that have the highest uh, percentage of college grads are um, Arkadelphia, Little Rock, and Conway. Hmm. I wonder what Arkadelphia, Little Rock, and Conway have over Malvern. Oh, yeah, they have universities. All right. So, you know, we might, there might be some differences. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Okay, so here is our model. Our scatter plot and model for when we're comparing percent of college graduates to median income. So just, you know, sometimes I have to just stop back and look at, okay, what am I even looking at in this problem? Um, what does a point represent? Just one single point represent. Let's look at this guy way up here. So what does this guy tell us, Mr. Bobby? Uh, it looks like it's around 33% college graduates and the median income is around 65,000. Yeah. So it gives me, I can see, 30, I'm, I'm guessing 33. Yeah. So here's yeah. Bryant. Okay. Right? 65,000, that was our Bryant? I think so, yeah. Yeah. So here's Bryant. Does Bryant fit the rest they're, of the cities? They're high, they're, they seem a lot higher than okay. some of the other points in the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then here's this guy, and I actually don't know who this guy is, but he seems really low. I think this might be Arkadelphia. I think that's Arkadelphia, yeah. yeah. They have a lot of college graduates because there's two universities in Arkadelphia. Right. But if you're familiar with the Arkadelphia area, there's not, you yeah, there's know. not a lot of job opportunity. No. People who live in Bryant tend to maybe drive to Little Rock or have businesses. There's some, you know, some companies in that area. Um, so there's other factors, although, it, you know, you are told, and we, I know I was told, get you a college education so yeah. you can go make a good living. Was yeah. it when my people's never heard that or had that thrust upon oh, yeah. you? I mean, 100%. I think these people that are sitting in with us right now are probably thinking, wait, why am I getting a college? Yeah. So you really need, I mean, not only does, I mean, does that play a factor? Does this play, is this good enough to tell me that there is some kind of relationship? Possibly. Yeah, that's, that makes me think that there, it's a contributing factor, but it's not the only factor. Right. Um, so. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so the question here is, we want to use the model to predict median income for a city with 33%. So that would be right. right about here. I am, I'm going to do the guesstimate method. I'm going to go up to the graph, and then I'm going to scoop over and... I may not have done it perfectly, right around 45,000-ish. Yeah. And I could plug it in my calculator using the equation. Do you yeah. want me to actually do it or? No, you don't have to. I think they probably know how to do that. Although, um, I know this, this video is probably getting a little long, but I do want to kind of think about, um, let's talk about these numbers really quick so that we can make sure we kind of got it in our heads. Um, our slope is 614.8. What does our slope mean in this problem? That's median per percent college graduate. So that's how much every time more college graduates, that's how much more for each percentage the income, median income will go. Right. So we, we do see a positive correlation with percent income. I want to be clear about that. I mean, with percent college graduate, I want to be clear about that. Like the more We're college not, graduates you have, the yeah. income does, in fact, go up. Um, it's just maybe not as closely correlated as we would like it to be. <laughs> Wait for that. It's been, his feet have been sticking out for half an hour now. <laughs> I don't think these people care. No, I say I got Coyote there. And look, he actually, they're like, who is that on your arm? Did you see this one? Yes, yes, yes. All right. Mr. Bobby is showing his tattoos off right now. <laughs> I don't have to show my foot off, you know, to show my tattoos off. All right. So right, the next question is like, okay, all right. Let's then just see if, because, you know, we kind of think like the bigger city we live in, the more job opportunities there are, the income will probably go up, right? So let's look at population and median income. So... Let's do this first. Look at that R value. What? 
like that R value is not great. Why is that R value not great? What is happening? Well, the first thing I notice is this point, which appears so different from the rest of the point. So who, who is that? What is that? What does that point mean? That's, is that Little Rock? That's the biggest city, right? That would yeah, have to be. That's what, 200,000? So I think, yeah, that was definitely the biggest city on the list is that 200,000. Okay, so do you think maybe then it's Bryant again throwing us off? Because really we got a couple of different potential outliers here that mm -hmm. are throwing off our R value. Do we think it's Little Rock? Or do we think it's Bryant? What do you think, Mr. Bobby? Well, no, I'm not sure which one's typical of Arkansas. In fact, actually, probably neither one of them is typical of Arkansas. Right. If you ask me, I mean, Bryant doesn't define Arkansas for me. You know, there's lots of small towns and neither does Little Rock. We have, what, two major cities? Actually, really, just no, there's no other city quite as large as Little Rock. So neither one of those describes the entire state to me. So this isn't necessary, and it doesn't, it's, it's a comparison between city and rural life or suburban life. It's right. not, so her experiment might, you know, may not necessarily be logically chosen. Right. Not, not to criticize you or anything, but because that's the point. Of right. This. Um, so, like these are these were questions bouncing around in my head yeah. why not look it up look at it i'm mm -hmm. not at all looking at this convinced in central arkansas that population will determine or help determine median income i'm just not based yeah. on what i'm seeing here um, but based on what we saw in the last graph i'm i'm feeling like college graduation rates have something to do with it maybe not the sole explanation but this is not convincing me as an argument Right. Um, I like to stop and talk about the slope because I always think it's important for us to understand what's happening in the problem. So it is true that the slope is positive. So the larger the population, the median income is coming up, sort of like, but that R value is low. So what do I do about this? Well, that way, again, I'm going to go back to what on the Y income. The median income would go up by four cents for an increase in population. So every time you increase the pop the, the population by one, the median income goes up by four cents. Yeah. Although guys, understand like this is an average rate. Like average. if if a doctor moves in town, your average income might go up by more than four cents. Right. right? If a school teacher moves in town. Your average yeah. income is potentially going to decrease. <laughs> okay, I'm done. I'm done. Yeah. Four, One more four. thing we could look at based on the census information that I gave you is a comparison of median income to percentage of different ethnicities and how much they increase. Okay. So if we look at percent of the white population versus median income, look at that R value. It's as close as college graduation rates were. So what are we noticing here? Again, it's a positive correlation. It's in the middle of the road kind of R value. It's, it's maybe a factor, but it's not the only factor again. Um, but, you know, it seems like the more, the greater percentage of white uh, people you have, the higher the income. Okay. So. The question. Do what? Go ahead. You're right. Um, what do you say? So let's look at African American. Again, Why is our R value negative now? Because as the percentage of African Americans go up, Seems like the income is going down. And even though it's below 0.5, it's still pretty close to 0.5. It's almost as strong as the relationship to white. Yep. Yep. And you can see here that our sign of our slope changes with our sign of our R value. If our slope is negative, 
our R value is going to be negative. Both of these things tell you direction. R value tells you direction and slope will tell you direction of your model. Now we're not trying to really, I mean, this is just what the data shows. This is what yeah. Ms. Young picked. She had a question in her mind and whether, you know, it's not the only factor, but boy, it's possible. Sure. Yeah. It's actually troubling. Yep, very troubling. Um, and we're gonna look at one more. So the other one that we're gonna look at is percent Hispanic. Look at that R value. Now this one is also negative, meaning that as you have more uh, higher percentage of Hispanics, the income would go down, but that relationship is significantly yeah. weaker because it's less than 0.2, it's pretty close to one. This yeah. might be because the, the um, Hispanic population might be a smaller population and we have more the, um, erratic, erratic data, I guess. Yeah, is, yeah. Uh, if I took the regression. You only picked, I think, what, eight or nine cities? You didn't pick, you know, a ton of data. But still, based on what she saw, there's some troubling data here. Yeah. Okay. Um, also, if I took the regression line off of this, you would almost have trouble even seeing if I were to take Bryant off, which we already talked about, Bryant is like throwing us for a loop here. Um, and, and I took off the regression line, you would have a hard time telling me if this data was positive or negative. Yeah. Um, I would venture to say that I don't think that the Hispanic population for this group of cities plays a role in the median income. That R value is too close to zero for me. And if I'm just uh, like looking at the data, not considering Brian at all, it doesn't seem like I can even say it's positive or negative. I mean, there are other questions she could have asked, but she didn't gather the data, probably didn't have time, male versus female. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, and I could have pulled a lot of stuff, guys, but yeah, I don't want to keep you on not this. Trying to be super controversial. We ask a question, we gather the data, and then the, the data tell us a story. Absolutely. Um, I really want to go on an African safari. This is like a life dream of mine is to go to Africa and see like the animals in their natural habitat. One of these days, this is going to happen for me. Look at the beautiful zebra. Yeah, well, you can go to the, well, I guess you can't go to the zoo right now. The zoo's closed, but. But that's not their natural habitat. Look at how beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You and your, you and your travel. So to, <laughs> today, you guys are going to start the progress check, <laughs> unit two progress check on AP Classroom. That is part B. You should have now completed part A, and you're going to begin part B. Um, thank you for joining us today, and we will see you for the next installment. Bye. Bye.